Chapter Twenty One of A Shepherd's Life by William Henry Hudson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty One: The Shepherd as Naturalist. General Remarks: Great Ridge Wood. Encounter with a Roe Deer. A Hare on a Stump. A Gamekeeper's Memory. Talk with a Gypsy. A Strange Story of a Hedgehog. A Gypsy on Memory. The Shepherd's Feeling for Animals. Anecdote of a Shrew anecdote of an owl reflex effect of the gameskeeper's calling we remember best what we see emotionally it will appear to some of my readers that the interesting facts about wild life or rather about animal life wild and domestic gathered in my talks with the old shepherd do not amount to much if this is all there is to show after a long life spent out of doors or all that is best worth preserving it is a somewhat scanty harvest they will say to me it appears a somewhat abundant one. We field naturalists who set down what we see and hear in a notebook, lest we forget it, do not always bear in mind that it is exceedingly rare for those who are not naturalists, whose senses and minds are occupied with other things, to come upon a new and interesting fact in animal life, or that these chance observations are quickly forgotten this was strongly borne in upon me lately while staying in the village of hindon in the neighbourhood of the great ridge wood which closed the summit of the long high down overlooking the vale of the wylie it is an immense wood mostly of scrub or dwarf oak very dense in some parts in others thin with open barren patches and like a wild forest covering altogether twelve or fourteen square miles perhaps more there are no houses near, and no people in it except a few gamekeepers. I spent long days in it without meeting a human being. It was a joy to me to find such a spot in England, so wild and solitary, and I was filled with pleasing anticipation of all the wild life I should see in such a place, especially after an experience I had on my second day in it i was standing in an open glade when a cock pheasant uttered a cry of alarm and immediately afterwards startled by the cry perhaps a roe deer rushed out of the close thicket of oak and holly in which it had been hiding and ran past me at a very short distance giving me a good sight of this shyest of the large wild animals still left to us he looked very beautiful to me in that mouse-coloured coat which makes him invisible in the deep shade in which he is accustomed to pass the daylight hours in hiding as he fled across the green open space in the brilliant may sunshine but he was only one a chance visitor a wanderer from wood to wood about the land and he had been seen once a month before my encounter with him and ever since then the keepers had been watching and waiting for him gun in hand to send a charge of shot into his side that was the best and the only great thing i saw in the great ridge wood for the curse of the pheasant is on it as on all the woods and forests in wiltshire and all wild life considered injurious to the semi-domestic bird from the sparrow-hawk to the harrier and buzzard and goshawk and from the little mousing weasel to the badger and all the wild life that is only beautiful or which delights us because of its wildness from the squirrel to the roe deer must be included in the slaughter one very long summer day spent in roaming about in this endless wood always on the watch had for sole result so far as anything out of the common goes the spectacle of a hare sitting on a stump the hare started up at a distance of over a hundred yards before me and rushed straight away at first then turned and ran on my left so as to get round to the side from which i had come i stood still and watched him as he moved swiftly over the ground seeing him not as a hare but as a dim brown object successively appearing vanishing and reappearing behind and between the brown tree trunks until he had traced half a circle and was then suddenly lost to sight thinking that he had come to a stand i put my binocular on the spot where he had vanished and saw him sitting on an old oak stump about thirty inches long it was a round mossy stump about eighteen inches in diameter standing in a bed of brown dead leaves with the rough brown trunks of other dwarf oak trees on either side of it the animal was sitting motionless in profile its ears erect 
seeing me with one eye and was like a carved figure of a hare set on a pedestal and had a very striking appearance as i had never seen such a thing before i thought it was worth mentioning to a keeper i called to see at his lodge on my way back in the evening it had been a blank day i told him a hare sitting on a stump being the only thing i could remember to tell him well he said you've seen something i've never seen in all the years i've been in these woods and yet when you come to think of it it's just what one might expect a hare would do the wood is full of old stumps and it seems only natural a hare would jump on one to get a better view of a man or animal at a distance among the trees but i never saw it what then had he seen worth remembering during his long hours in the wood on that day or the day before or on any day during the last thirty years since he had been policing that wood i asked him he answered that he had seen many strange things but he was not now able to remember one to tell me he said further that the only things he remembered were those that related to his business of guarding and rearing the birds all other things he observed in animals however remarkable they might seem to him at the moment were things that didn't matter and were quickly forgotten on the very next day i was out on the down with a gypsy and we got talking about wild animals he was a middle-aged man and a very perfect specimen of his race not one of the blue-eyed and red or light-haired bastard gypsies but dark as a red indian with eyes like a hawk and altogether a hawk-like being lean wiry alert a perfectly wild man in a tame civilized land the lean mouse-coloured lurcher that followed at his heels was perfect too in his way man and dog appeared made for one another when this man spoke of his life spent in roaming about the country of his very perfect health and of his hatred of house the very atmosphere of any indoor place producing a suffocating and sickening effect on him i envied him as i envy birds their wings and as i can never envy men who live in mansions his was the wild the real life and it seemed to me that there was no other worth living you know said he in the course of our talk about wild animals we are very fond of hedgehogs we like them better than rabbits well so do i was my remark i am not quite sure that i do but that is what i told him but now you talk of hedgehogs i said it's funny to think that common as the animal is it has some queer habits i can't find anything about from gamekeepers and others i've talked to on the subject or from my own observations yet one would imagine that we know all there is to be known about the little beast you'll find his history in a hundred books perhaps in five hundred there's one book about our british animals so big you'd hardly be able to lift its three volumes from the ground with all your strength in which its author has raked together everything known about the hedgehog but he doesn't give me the information i want just what i went to the book to find now here's what a friend of mine once saw he's not a naturalist nor a sportsman nor a gamekeeper and not a gypsy he doesn't observe animals or want to find out their ways he is a writer occupied day and night with his writing sitting among books yet he saw something which the naturalists and gamekeepers haven't seen so far as i know he was going home one moonlit night by a footpath through the woods when he heard a very strange noise a little distance ahead a low whistling sound very sharp like the continuous twittering of a little bird with a voice like a bat or a shrew only softer more musical he went on very cautiously until he spied two hedgehogs standing on the path facing each other with their noses almost or quite touching he remained watching and listening to them for some moments then tried to go a little nearer and they ran away now i've asked about a dozen gamekeepers if they ever saw such a thing and all said they hadn't they never heard hedgehogs make that twittering sound like a bird or a singing mouse they had only heard them scream like a rabbit when in a trap now what do you say about it i've never seen anything like that said the gypsy i only know the hedgehog makes a little whistling sound when first he comes out at night i believe it is a sort of call they have but no doubt i said you've seen other queer things in hedgehogs and in other little animals which i should like to hear 
yes he had first and last seen a good many queer things both by day and night in woods and other places he replied and then continued but you see it's like this we see something and say now that's a very curious thing and then we forget all about it you see we don't lay no store by such things we ain't scholars and don't know nothin about what's said in books we see something and say that's something we never saw before and never heard of but maybe others have seen it and you can find it in the books so that's how tis but if i hadn't forgotten them i could have told you a lot of queer things that was all he could say and few can say more caleb was one of the few who could and one wonders why it was so seeing that he was occupied with his own tasks in the fields and on the down where the wild life is least abundant and varied and that his opportunities were so few compared with those of the gamekeeper it was i take it because he had sympathy for the creatures he observed that their actions had stamped themselves on his memory because he had seen them emotionally we have seen how well he remembered the many sheep-dogs he had owned how vividly their various characters are portrayed in his account of them i have met with shepherds who had little to tell about the dogs they had possessed they had regarded their dogs as useful servants and nothing more as long as they lived and when dead they were forgotten but caleb had a feeling for his dogs which made it impossible for him to forget them or to recall them without that tenderness which accompanies the thought of vanished human friends in a lesser degree he had something of this feeling for all animals down even to the most minute and unconsidered i recall here one of his anecdotes of a very small creature a shrew or overrunner as he called it one day when out with his flock a sudden storm of rain caused him to seek for shelter in an old untrimmed hedge close by he crept into the ditch full of old dead leaves beneath the tangle of thorns and brambles and setting his back against the bank he thrust his legs out and as he did so was startled by an outburst of shrill little screams at his feet looking down he spied a shrew standing on the dead leaves close to his boot screaming with all its might its long thin snout pointed upwards and its mouth wide open and just above it two or three inches perhaps hovered a small brown butterfly there for a few moments it continued hovering while the shrew continued screaming then the butterfly flitted away and the shrew disappeared among the dead leaves caleb laughed a rare thing with him when he narrated this little incident then remarked the overrunner was a crying cause he couldn't catch that leetle butterfly the shepherd's inference was wrong he did not know few do that the shrew has the singular habit when surprised on the surface and in danger of remaining motionless and uttering shrill cries his foot set down close to it had set it screaming the small butterfly no doubt disturbed at the same moment was there by chance i recall another little story he related of a bird a long-eared owl one summer there was a great drought and the rooks unable to get their usual food from the hard sun-baked pasture lands attacked the roots and would have pretty well destroyed them if the farmer had not protected his swedes by driving in stakes and running cotton thread and twine from stake to stake all over the field this kept them off just as thread keeps the chaff inches from the seed beds in small gardens and as it keeps the sparrows from the crocuses on lawn and ornamental grounds one day caleb caught sight of an odd-looking brownish-gray object out in the middle of the term field and as he looked it rose up two or three feet into the air then dropped back again and this curious movement was repeated at intervals of two or three minutes until he went to see what the thing was it turned out to be a long-eared owl with its foot accidentally caught by a slack thread which allowed the bird to rise a couple of feet into the air but every such attempt to escape ended in its being pulled back to the ground again it was so excessively lean so weightless in his hand when he took it up after disengaging its foot that he thought it must have been captive for the space of two or three days the wonder was that it had kept alive during those long summer days of intolerable heat out there in the middle of the burning field 
yet it was in very fine feather and beautiful to look at with its long black ear tufts and round orange-yellow eyes which would never lose their fiery lustre until glazed in death caleb's first thought on seeing it closely was that it would have been a prize to any one who liked to have a handsome bird stuffed in a glass case then raising it over his head he allowed it to fly whereupon it flew off at a distance of a dozen or fifteen yards and pitched among the turnips after which it ran a little space and rose again with labour but soon recovering strength it flew away over the field and finally disappeared in the deep shade of the copse beyond in relating these things the voice the manner the expression in his eyes were more than the mere words and displayed the feeling which had caused these little incidents to endure so long in his memory the gamekeeper cannot have this feeling he may have come to his task with the liveliest interest in even with sympathy for the wild creatures amidst which he will spend his life but it is all soon lost his business in the woods is to kill and the reflex effect is to extinguish all interest in the living animal in its life and mind it would indeed be a wonderful thing if he could remember any singular action or appearance of an animal which he had witnessed before bringing his gun automatically to his shoulder End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of a shepherd's life by william henry hudson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty two the master of the village moral effect of the great man an orphaned village the masters of the village elijah raven strange appearance and character elijah's house the owls two rooms in the house elijah hardens with time the village club and its arbitrary secretary caleb dips the lambs and falls ill his claim on the club rejected elijah in court in my roamings about the downs it is always a relief a positive pleasure in fact to find myself in a village which has no squire or other magnificent and munificent person who dominates everybody and everything and if he chooses to do so plays providence in the community i may have no personal objection to him he is sometimes almost if not quite human what i heartily dislike is the effect of his position that of a giant among pygmies on the lowly minds about him and the servility hypocrisy and parasitism which spring up and flourish in his wide shadow whether he likes these moral weeds or not as a rule he likes them since the poor devil has this in common with the rest of us that he likes to stand high in the general regard but how is he to know it unless he witnesses its outward beautiful signs every day and every hour on every countenance he looks upon better to my mind the severer conditions the poverty and unmerited sufferings which cannot be relieved with the greater manliness and self-dependence when the people are left to work out their own destiny on this account i was pleased to make the discovery on my first visit to caleb's native village that there was no magnate or other big man and no gentleman except the parson who was not a rich man it was so to speak one of the orphaned villages left to fend for itself and fight its own way in a hard world and had nobody even to give the customary blankets and sack of coals to its old women nor was there any very big farmer in the place certainly no gentleman farmer they were mostly small men some of them hardly to be distinguished in speech and appearance from their hired labourers in these small isolated communities it is common to find men who have succeeded in rising above the others and in establishing a sort of mastery over them they are not as a rule much more intelligent than the others who are never able to better themselves the main difference is that they are harder and more grasping and have more self-control these qualities tell eventually and set a man a little apart a little higher than the others and he gets the taste of power which reacts on him like the first taste of blood on the big cat henceforward he has his ideal his definite goal which is to get the upper hand to be on top he may be, and generally is, an exceedingly unpleasant fellow to have for a neighbor, 
mean sordid greedy tyrannous even cruel and he may be generally hated and despised as well but along with these feelings there will be a kind of shamefaced respect and admiration for his courage in following his own line in defiance of what others think and feel it is after all with man as with social animals he must have a master not a policeman or magistrate or a vague far-away impersonal something called the authorities or the government but a head of the pack or herd a being like himself whom he knows and sees and hears and feels every day a real man dressed in old familiar clothes a fellow villager who wolf or dog-like has fought his way to the mastership there was a person of this kind at winterbourne bishop who was often mentioned in caleb's reminiscences for he had left a very strong impression on the shepherd's mind as strong perhaps though in a disagreeable way as that of isaac his father and of mr ellerby of doveton for not only was he a man of great force of character but he was of eccentric habits and of a somewhat grotesque appearance the curious name of this person was elijah raven he was a native of the village and lived till extreme old age in it the last of his family in a small house inherited from his father situated about the centre of the village street it was a quaint old timbered house little bigger than a cottage with a thatched roof and behind it some outbuildings a small orchard and a field of a dozen or fifteen acres here he lived with one other person an old man who did the cooking and housework but after this man died he lived alone not only was he a bachelor but he would never allow any woman to come inside his house elijah's one idea was to get the advantage of others to make himself master in the village beginning poor he worked in a small cautious peddling way at farming taking a field or meadow or strip of down here and there in the neighbourhood keeping a few sheep a few cows buying and selling and breeding horses the men he employed were those he could get at low wages poor labourers who were without a place and wanted to fill up a vacant time or men like the targets described in a former chapter who could be imposed upon also gypsies who flitted about the country working in a spasmodic way when in the mood for the farmers who could tolerate them and who were paid about half the wages of an ordinary labourer if a poor man had to find money quickly on account of illness or some other cause he could get it from elijah at once not borrowed since elijah neither lent nor gave but he could sell him anything he possessed a horse or cow or sheep-dog or a piece of furniture and if he had nothing to sell elijah would give him something to do and pay him something for it the great thing was that elijah had money which he was always willing to circulate at his unlamented death he left several thousands of pounds which went to a distant relation and a name which does not smell sweet but is still remembered not only at winterbourne bishop but at many other villages on salisbury plain elijah was short of stature broad-shouldered with an abnormally big head and large dark eyes they say that he never cut his hair in his life it was abundant and curly and grew to his shoulders and when he was old and his great mass of hair and beard became white it was said that he resembled a gigantic white owl mothers frightened their children into quiet by saying elijah will get you if you don't behave yourself he knew and resented this and though he never noticed a child he hated to have the little one staring in a half terrified way at him to seclude himself more from the villagers he planted holly and yew bushes before his house and eventually the entire building was hidden from sight by the dense evergreen thicket the trees were cut down after his death they were gone when i first visited the village and by chance found a lodging in the house and congratulated myself that i had got the quaintest old rambling rooms i had ever inhabited i did not know that it was in elijah raven's house although his name had long been familiar to me it only came out one day when i asked my landlady who was a native to tell me the history of the place she remembered how as a little girl full of mischief and greatly daring she had sometimes climbed over the low front wall to hide under the thick yew bushes and watch to catch sight of the old owlish man at his door or window 
For many years Elijah had two feathered tenants, a pair of white owls, the birds he so much resembled. They occupied a small garret at the end of his bedroom, having access to it through a hole under the thatch. They bred there in peace, and on summer evenings one of the common sights of the village was Elijah's owls flying from the house behind the evergreens and returning to it with mice in their talons. At such seasons the threat to the unruly children would be varied to, "'Old Elijah's owls will get you!' Naturally the children grew up with the idea of the birds and the owlish old man associated in their minds." it was odd that the two very rooms which elijah had occupied during all those solitary years the others being given over to spiders and dust should have been assigned to me when i came to lodge in the house the first my sitting-room was so low that my hair touched the ceiling when i stood up my full height it had a brick floor and a wide old fireplace on one side though so low-ceilinged it was very large and good to be in when i returned from a long ramble on the downs sometimes wet and cold to sit by a wood fire and warm myself at night when i climbed to my bedroom by means of the narrow crooked worm-eaten staircase with two difficult and dangerous corners to get around i would lie awake staring at the small square patch of greyness in the black interior made by the latticed window and listening to the wind and rain outside, would remember that the sordid, owlish old man had slept there and stared nightly at that very same grey patch in the dark for very many years. If, I thought, that something of a man which remains here below to haunt the scene of its past life is more likely to exist and appear to mortal eyes in the case of a person of strong individuality, then there is a chance that I may be visited this night by Elijah Raven, his ghost. But his owlish countenance never appeared between me and that patch of pale dim light, nor did I ever feel a breath of cold, unearthly air on me elijah did not improve with time the years that made him long-haired whiter and more owl-like also made him more penurious and grasping and anxious to get the better of every person about him there was scarcely a poor person in the village not a field labourer nor shepherd nor farmer's boy nor any old woman he had employed who did not consider that they had suffered at his hands the very poorest could not escape if he got someone to work for fourpence a day, he would find a reason to keep back a portion of the small sum due to him. At the same time he wanted to be well thought of, and at length an opportunity came to him to figure as one who did not live wholly for himself, but rather as a person ready to go out of his way to help his neighbours. There had long existed a small benefit society, or club, in the village, to which most of the farmhands in the parish belonged, the members numbering about sixty or seventy. Subscriptions were paid quarterly, but the rules were not strict, and any member could take a week or a fortnight longer to pay. When a member fell ill, he received half the amount of his wages a week from the funds at hand, and once a year they had a dinner the secretary was a labourer and in time he grew old and infirm and could not hold a pen in his rheumatic fingers and a meeting was held to consider what was to be done in the matter it was not an easy one to settle there were few members capable of keeping the books who would undertake the duty as it was unpaid and no one among them well known and trusted by all the members it was then that elijah raven came to the rescue he attended the meeting, which he was allowed to do owing to his being a person of importance, the only one of that description in the village, and getting up on his legs he made the offer to act as secretary himself. This came as a great surprise, and the offer was at once and unanimously accepted, all unpleasant feelings being forgotten, and for the first time in his life Elijah heard himself praised as a disinterested person one it was good to have in the village. Things went on very well for a time, and at the yearly dinner of the club, a few months later, Elijah gave an account of his stewardship, showing that the club had a surplus of two hundred pounds. Shortly after this, trouble began. 
elijah it was said was making use of his position as secretary for his own private interests and to pay off old scores against those he disliked when a man came with his quarterly subscription elijah would perhaps remember that this person had refused to work for him or that he had some quarrel with him and if the subscription was overdue he would refuse to take it he would tell the man that he was no longer a member and he also refused to give sick pay to any applicant whose last subscription was still due if he happened to be in elijah's black book by and by he came into collision with caleb one of the villagers against whom he cherished a special grudge and this small affair resulted in the dissolution of the club at this time caleb was head shepherd at bartle's cross a large farm above a mile and a half from the village one excessively hot day in august he had to dip the lambs it was very hard work to drive them from the farm over a high down to the stream a mile below the village where there was a dipping place and he was tired and hot and in a sweat when he began to work with his arms bared to the shoulders he took and plunged his first lamb into the tank when engaged in dipping, he said, he always kept his mouth closed tightly, for fear of getting even a drop of the mixture in it. But on this occasion it unfortunately happened that the man assisting him spoke to him, and he was compelled to reply, but had no sooner opened his mouth to speak than the lamb made a violent struggle in his arms, and splashed the water over his face and into his mouth. He got rid of it as quickly as he could, but soon began to feel bad and before the work was over he had to sit down two or three times to rest however he struggled on to the finish then took the flock home and went to his cottage he could do no more the farmer came to see what the matter was and found him in a fever with face and throat greatly swollen you look bad he said you must be off to the doctor but it was five miles to the village where the doctor lived and bawcombe replied that he couldn't go i'm too bad i couldn't go master if you offered me money for it he said then the farmer mounted his horse and went himself and the doctor came no doubt he said you've got some of the poison into your system and took a chill at the same time the illness lasted six weeks and then the shepherd resumed work although still feeling very shaky by and by, when the opportunity came, he went to claim his sick pay, six shillings a week, for the six weeks, his wages being then twelve shillings. Elijah flatly refused to pay him. His subscription, he said, had been due for several weeks, and he had consequently forfeited his right to anything. In vain the shepherd explained that he could not pay when lying ill at home with no money in the house, and receiving no pay from the farmer the old man remained obdurate and with a very heavy heart the shepherd came out and found three or four of the villagers waiting in the road outside to hear the result of the application they too were men who had been turned away from the club by the arbitrary secretary caleb was telling them about his interview when elijah came out of the house and leaning over the front gate began to listen the shepherd then turned towards him and said in a loud voice mr elijah raven don't you think this is a tarrible hard case i've paid my subscription every quarter for thirty years and never had anything from the fund except two weeks pay when i were bad some years ago now i've been bad six weeks and my master given me nothing for that time and i've got the doctor to pay and nothing to live on what am i to do elijah stared at him in silence for some time then spoke i told you in there i wouldn't pay you one penny of the money and i'll hold to what i said in there i said it indoors and i say it again that indoors i'll never pay you no not one penny piece but if i happen some day to meet you out of doors then i'll pay you now go and go he did very meekly his wrath going down as he trudged home for after all he would have his money by and by although the hard old man would punish him for past offences by making him wait for it a week or so went by and then one day while passing through the village he saw elijah coming towards him and said to himself now i'll be paid when the two men drew near together he cried out cheerfully good morning mr raven 
the other without a word and without a pause passed by on his way leaving the poor shepherd gazing crestfallen after him after all he would not get his money the question was discussed in the cottages and by and by one of the villagers who was not so poor as most of them and went occasionally to salisbury said he would ask an attorney's advice about the matter he would pay for the advice out of his own pocket he wanted to know if elijah could lawfully do such things to the man's astonishment the attorney said that as the club was not registered and the members had themselves made elijah their head he could do as he liked no action would lie against him but if it was true and it could be proved that he had spoken those words about paying the shepherd his money if he met him out of doors then he could be made to pay he also said he would take the case up and bring it into court if a sum of five pounds was guaranteed to cover expenses in case the decision went against them poor caleb with twelve shillings a week to pay his debts and live on could guarantee nothing but by and by when the lawyer's opinion had been discussed at great length at the inn and in all the cottages in the village it was found that several of balcombe's friends were willing to contribute something towards a guarantee fund and eventually the sum of five pounds was raised and handed over to the person who had seen the lawyer his first step was to send for balcombe who had to get a day off and journey in the carrier's cart one market day to salisbury the result was that action was taken and in due time the case came on elijah raven was in court with two or three of his friends small working farmers who had some interested motive in desiring to appear as his supporters he too had engaged a lawyer to conduct his case the judge said balcombe who had never seen one before was a tarrible stern-looking man in his wig the plaintiff's lawyer he did open the case and he did talk and talk a lot but elijah's counsel he did keep on interrupting him and they too argued and argued but the judge he never said no word only he looked blacker and more tarrible stern then when the talk did seem all over balcombe ignorant of the forms got up and said i beg your lordship's pardon but may i speak he didn't rightly remember afterwards what he called him but twere your lordship or your worship he was sure yes certainly you are here to speak said the judge and balcombe then gave an account of his interview with elijah and of the conversation outside the house then up rose elijah raven and in a loud voice exclaimed lord lord what a sad thing it is to have to sit here and listen to this man's lies sit down sir thundered the judge sit down and hold your tongue or i shall have you removed then elijah's lawyer jumped up and the judge told him he better sit down too because he knowed who the liar was in this case a brutal case he said and that was the end and balcombe got his six weeks sick pay and expenses and about three pounds besides being his share of the society's funds which elijah had been advised to distribute to the members and that was the end of the winterbourne bishop club and from that time it has continued without one End of chapter 22「twenty three of a Shepherd's Life by William Henry Hudson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty three Isaac's Children Isaac Balcombe's Family The Youngest Son Caleb Goes to Seek David at Wilton Sheep Fair Martha the Eldest Daughter Her Beauty She Marries Shepherd Iret The Name of Iret Story of Ellen Iret The Irets Go to Somerset Martha and the Lady of the Manor martha's travels her mistress dies return to winterbourne bishop shepherd irit's end caleb was one of five the middle one with a brother and sister older and a brother and sister younger than himself a symmetrical family i have already written incidentally of the elder brother and the youngest sister and in this chapter will complete the history of isaac's children by giving an account of the eldest sister and youngest brother the brother was david the hot-tempered young shepherd who killed his dog monk and who afterwards followed his brother to warminster in spite of his temper and want of sense caleb was deeply attached to him and when as an old man his shepherding days were finished he followed his wife to their new home he grieved at being so far removed from his favourite brother 
For some time he managed to make the journey to visit him once a year. Not to his home near Warminster, but to Wilton, at the time of the great annual sheep fair held on 12th September. From his cottage he would go by the carrier's cart to the nearest town, and thence by rail with one or two changes by Salisbury to Wilton. After I became acquainted with Caleb, he was ill and not likely to recover, and for over two years could not get about. During all this time he spoke often to me of his brother, and wished he could see him. I wondered why he did not write, but he would not, nor would the other. These people of the older generation do not write to each other. Years are allowed to pass without tidings, and they wonder and wish and talk of this and that absent member of the family, trusting it is well with them, but to write a letter never enters into their minds. At last Caleb began to mend, and determined to go again to Wilton Sheep Fair to look for his beloved brother. To Warminster he could not go. It was too far. September the twelfth saw him once more at the old meeting-place, painfully making his slow way to that part of the ground where shepherd David Balcombe was accustomed to put his sheep. But he was not there. "'I be here too soon,' said Caleb, and sat himself patiently down to wait. But hours passed, and David did not appear. So he got up and made his way about the fair in search of him, but couldn't find him. Returning to the old spot, he got into conversation with two young shepherds, and told them he was waiting for his brother, who always put his sheep in that part. "'What be his name?' they asked, and when he gave it, they looked at one another and were silent. Then one of them said, "'Be you shepherd Caleb Balcombe?' And when he had answered them, the other said, "'You'll not see your brother at Wilton to-day. We've come from Doveton, and knew he. You'll not see your brother no more.' He be dead these two years. Caleb thanked them for telling him, and got up and went his way very quietly, and got back that night to his cottage. He was very tired, said his wife. He wouldn't eat, and he wouldn't talk. Many days passed, and he still sat in his corner and brooded, until the wife was angry, and said she never knowed a man make so great a trouble over losing a brother. "'Twas not like losing a wife or a son, she said. But he answered not a word, and it was many weeks before that dreadful sadness began to wear off, and he could talk cheerfully once more of his old life in the village. Of the sister Martha there is much more to say. Her life was an eventful one, as lives go in this quiet downland country, and she was, moreover, distinguished above the others of the family by her beauty and vivacity. I only knew her when her age was over eighty in her native village, where her life ended some time ago, but even at that age there was something of her beauty left, and a good deal of her charm. She had a good figure still, and was of a good height, and had dark, fine eyes, clear, dark, unwrinkled skin, a finely shaped face, and her grey hair, once black, was very abundant. Her manner, too, was very engaging. At the age of twenty-five she married a shepherd named Thomas Irat, a surname I had not heard before, and which made me wonder where were the Irats in Wiltshire that in all my rambles among the downland villages I had never come across them, not even in the churchyards. Nobody knew. There were no Irats except Martha Irat, the widow of Winterbourne Bishop, and her son. Nobody had ever heard of any other family of the name. I began to doubt that there ever had been such a name, until quite recently, when, on going over an old downland village church, the rector took me out to show me a strange name on a tablet let into the wall of the building outside. The name was Irat, and the date the seventeenth century. He had never seen the name excepting on that tablet. Who, then, was Martha's husband? It was a queer story, which she would never have told me, but I had it from her brother and his wife. A generation before that of Martha, at a farm in the village of Bower Chalk on the Ebble, there was a girl named Ellen Irat, employed as a dairymaid. She was not a native of the village, and if her parentage and place of birth were ever known, they had long passed out of memory. She was a good-looking, nice-tempered girl, and was much liked by her master and mistress, so that, after she had been about two years in their service, it came as a great shock to find that she was in the family way. 
the shock was all the greater when the fresh discovery was made one day that another unmarried woman in the house who was also a valued servant was in the same condition the two unhappy women had kept their secret from every one except from each other until it could be kept no longer and they consulted together and determined to confess it to their mistress and abide the consequences who were the men was the first question asked there was only one robert coombe the shepherd who lived at the farmhouse a slow silent almost inarticulate man with a round head and flaxen hair a bachelor of whom people were accustomed to say that he would never marry because no woman would have such a stolid dull-witted fellow for a husband but he was a good shepherd and had been many years on the farm and it was altogether a terrible business forthwith the farmer got out his horse and rode to the downs to have it out with the unconscionable wretch who had brought that shame and trouble on them he found him sitting on the turf eating his midday bread and bacon with a can of cold tea at his side and getting off his horse he went up to him and damned him for a scoundrel and abused him until he had no words left then told his shepherd that he must choose between the two women and marry at once so as to make an honest woman of one of the two poor fools either he must do that or quit the farm forthwith Coombe heard in silence and without a change in his countenance, masticating his food the while and washing it down with an occasional draught from his can, until he had finished his meal. Then taking his crook he got up and remarked that he would think of it, and went after his flock. The farmer rode back cursing him for a clod, and in the evening Coombe, after folding his flock, came in to give his decision, and said he had thought of it, and would take Jane to wife. She was a good deal older than Ellen, and not so good-looking, but she belonged to the village, and her people were there, and everybody knowed who Jane was, and she was an old servant, and would be wanted on the farm. Ellen was a stranger among them, and being only a dairymaid, was of less account than the other one so it was settled and on the following morning ellen the rejected was told to take up her traps and walk what was she to do in her condition no longer to be concealed alone and friendless in the world she thought of mrs poole an elderly woman of winterbourne bishop whose children were grown up and away from home who when staying at bower chalk some months before had taken a great liking for ellen and when parting with her had kissed her and said my dear i lived among strangers too when i were a girl and had no one of my own and know what it is that was all but there was nobody else and she resolved to go to mrs poole and so laden with her few belongings she set out to walk the long miles over the downs to winterbourne bishop where she had never been it was far to walk in hot august weather when she went that sad journey and she rested at intervals in the hot shade of a furze bush haunted all day by the miserable fear that the woman she sought of whom she knew so little would probably harden her heart and close her door against her but the good woman took compassion on her and gave her shelter in her poor cottage and kept her till her child was born in spite of all the women's bitter tongues and in the village where she had found refuge she remained to the end of her life without a home of her own but always in a room or two with her boy in some poor person's cottage her life was hard but not unpeaceful and the old people all dead and gone now remembered ellen as a very quiet staid woman who worked hard for a living sometimes at the wash-tub but mostly in the fields haymaking and harvesting and at other times weeding or collecting flints or with a spud or sickle extirpating thistles in the pasture land she worked alone or with other poor women but with the men she had no friendships the sharpest women's eyes in the village could see no fault in her in this respect if it had not been so if she had talked pleasantly with them and smiled when addressed by them her life would have been made a burden to her she would have been often asked who her brat's father was the dreadful experience of that day when she had been cast out and was alone in the world when burdened with her unborn child she had walked over the downs in the hot august weather in anguish of apprehension had sunk into her soul 
her very nature was changed and in a man's presence her blood seemed frozen and if spoken to she answered in monosyllables with her eyes on the earth this was noted with the result that all the village women were her good friends they never reminded her of her fall and when she died still young they grieved for her and befriended the little orphan boy she had left on their hands he was about eleven years old and was a stout little fellow with a round head and flaxen hair like his father but he was not so stolid and not like him in character at all events his old widow in speaking of him to me said that never in all his life did he do one unkind or unjust thing he came from a long line of shepherds and shepherding was perhaps almost instinctive in him from his earliest boyhood the tremulous bleating of the sheep and half-muffled clink of the copper bells and the sharp bark of the sheep-dog had a strange attraction for him he was always ready when a boy was wanted to take charge of a flock during a temporary absence of the shepherd and eventually when only about fifteen he was engaged as under shepherd and for the rest of his life shepherding was his trade his marriage to martha bowcombe came as a surprise to the village for though no one had any fault to find with tommy irat there was a slur on him and martha who was the finest girl in the place might it was thought have looked for some one better but martha had always liked tommy they were of the same age and had been playmates in their childhood growing up together their childish affection had turned to love and after they had waited some years and tommy had a cottage and seven shillings a week isaac and his wife gave their consent and they were married still they felt hurt at being discussed in this way by the villagers so that when irat was offered a place as shepherd at a distance from home where his family history was not known he was glad to take it and his wife to go with him about a month after her child was born the new place was in somerset thirty-five to forty miles from their native village and irat as shepherd at the manor-house farm on a large estate would have better wages than he had ever had before and a nice cottage to live in martha was delighted with her new home the cottage the entire village the great park and mansion close by all made it seem like paradise to her better than everything was the pleasant welcome she received from the villagers who looked in to make her acquaintance and seemed very much taken with her appearance and nice friendly manner they were all eager to tell her about the squire and his lady who were young and of how great an interest they took in their people and how much they did for them and how they were loved by everybody on the estate it happened oddly enough that i became acquainted with this same man the squire over fifty years after the events i am relating when he was past eighty this acquaintance came about by means of a letter he wrote me in reference to the habits of a bird or some such small matter a way in which i have become acquainted with scores perhaps i should say hundreds of persons in many parts of the country he was a very fine man the head of an old and distinguished county family an ideal squire and one of the few large landowners i have had the happiness to meet who was not devoted to that utterly selfish and degraded form of sport which consists in the annual rearing and subsequent slaughter of a host of pheasants now when martha was entertaining half a dozen of her new neighbours who had come in to see her and exhibited her baby to them and then proceeded to suckle it they looked at one another and laughed and one said just you wait till the lady at the mansion sees ye she'll soon want ye to nurse her little one what did they mean they told her that the great lady was a mother too and had a little sickly baby and wanted a nurse for it but couldn't find a woman to please her martha fired up at that did they imagine she asked that any great lady in the world with all her gold could tempt her to leave her own darling to nurse another woman's she would not do such a thing she would rather leave the place than submit to it but she didn't believe it they had only said that to tease her and frighten her they laughed again looking admiringly at her as she stood before them with sparkling eyes flushed cheeks and fine full busts and only answered just you wait my dear till she sees ye and very soon the lady did see her 
the people in the manor were strict in their religious observance and it had been impressed on martha that she had better attend at morning service on her first sunday and a girl was found by one of her neighbours to look after the baby in the meantime and so when sunday came she dressed herself in her best clothes and went to church with the others the service over the squire and his wife came out first and were standing in the path exchanging greetings with their friends then as the others came out with martha in the midst of the crowd the lady turned and fixed her eyes on her and suddenly stepping out from the group she stopped martha and said who are you i don't remember your face no ma'am said martha blushing and curtsying i be the new shepherd's wife at the manor house farm we've only been here a few days the other then said she had heard of her and that she was nursing her child and she then told martha to go to the mansion that afternoon as she had something to say to her the poor young mother went in fear and trembling trying to stiffen herself against the expected blandishments then followed the fateful interview the lady was satisfied that she had got hold of the right person at last the one in the world who would be able to save her precious little one from to die, the poor pining infant on whose frail little life so much depended. She would feed it from her full healthy breasts and give it something of her own abounding, splendid life. Martha's own baby would do very well, there was nothing the matter with it, and it would flourish on the bottle, or anything else, no matter what all she had to do was to go back to her cottage and make the necessary arrangements then come to stay at the mansion martha refused and the other smiled then martha pleaded and cried and said she would never never leave her own child and as all that had no effect she was angry and it came into her mind that if the lady would get angry too she would be ordered out and all would be over but the lady wouldn't get angry for when martha stormed she grew more gentle and spoke more tenderly and sweetly but would still have it her own way until the poor young mother could stand it no longer and so rushed away in a great state of agitation to tell her husband and ask him to help her against her enemy but tommy took the lady's side and his young wife hated him for it and was in despair and ready to snatch up her child and run away from them all when all at once a carriage appeared at the cottage and the great lady herself followed by a nurse with the sickly baby in her arms came in she had come she said very gently almost pleadingly to ask martha to feed her child once and martha was flattered and pleased at the request and took and fondled the infant in her arms then gave it to suck at her beautiful breast and when she had fed the child acting very tenderly towards it like a mother her visitor suddenly burst into tears and taking martha in her arms she kissed her and pleaded with her again until she could resist no more and it was settled that she was to live at the mansion and come once every day to the village to feed her own child from the breast martha's connection with the people at the mansion did not end when she had safely reared the sickly child the lady had become attached to her and wanted to have her always although martha could not act again as wet nurse for she had no more children herself and by and by when her mistress lost her health after the birth of a third child and was ordered abroad she took martha with her and she passed a whole year with her on the continent residing in france and italy they came home again, but as the lady continued to decline in health, she travelled again, still taking Martha with her, and they visited India and other distant countries, including the Holy Land. But travel and wealth and all that the greatest physicians in the world could do for her, and the tender care of a husband who worshipped her, availed not, and she came home in the end to die, and Martha went back to her Tommy, and the boy to be separated no more while their lives lasted the great house was shut up and remained so for years the squire was the last man in england to shirk his duties as landlord and to his people whom he loved and who loved him as few great landowners are loved in england but his grief was too great for even his great strength to bear up against and it was long feared by his friends that he would never recover from his loss 
but he was healed in time and ten years later married again and returned to his home to live there until nigh upon his ninetieth year long before this the arets had returned to their native village when i last saw martha then in her eighty-second year she gave me the following account of her tommy's end he continued shepherding up to the age of seventy-eight one sunday early in the afternoon when she was ill with an attack of influenza he came home and putting aside his crook said i've done work it's early she replied but maybe you got the boy to mind the sheep for you i don't mean i've done work for the day he returned i've done for good i'll not go with the flock no more what be saying she cried in sudden alarm be you feeling bad what be the matter no i'm not bad he said i'm perfectly well but i've done work and more than that he would not say she watched him anxiously but could see nothing wrong with him his appetite was good he smoked his pipe and was cheerful three days later she noticed that he had some difficulty in pulling on a stocking when dressing in the morning and went to his assistance he laughed and said here's a funny thing you be ill and i be well and you've got to help me put on a stocking and he laughed again after dinner that day he said he wanted a drink and would have a glass of beer there was no beer in the house and she asked him if he would have a cup of tea oh yes that'll do very well he said and she made it for him after drinking his cup of tea he got a footstool and placing it at her feet sat down on it and rested his head on her knees he remained a long time in this position so perfectly still that she at length bent over and felt and examined his face only to discover that he was dead and that was the end of tommy irat the son of ellen he died she said like a baby that had been fed and falls asleep on its mother's breast end of chapter twenty three Chapter Twenty Four of A Shepherd's Life by William Henry Hudson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Four Living in the Past. Evening Talks On the Construction of Sheepfolds, Making Hurdles, Devil's Guts, Character in Sheep Dogs, Sally the Spiteful Dog, Dyke the Lost Dog Who Returned, Strange Recovery of a Lost Dog, Badger the Playful Dog badger shepherds the fowls a ghost story a sunday evening talk parsons and ministers noisy religion the shepherd's love of his calling mark dick and the giddy sheep conclusion during our frequent evening talks often continued till a late hour it was borne in on caleb bawcombe that his anecdotes of wild creatures interested me more than anything else he had to tell but in spite of this or because he could not always bear it in mind the conversation almost invariably drifted back to the old subject of sheep of which he was never tired even in his sleep he does not forget them his dreams he says are always about sheep he is with the flock shifting the hurdles or following it out on the down a troubled dream when he is ill or uneasy in his sleep is invariably about some difficulty with the flock it gets out of his control and the dog cannot understand him or refuses to obey when everything depends on his instant action the subject was so much to him so important above all others that he would not spare the listener even the minutest details of the shepherd's life and work his hints on the construction of sheepfolds would have filled a volume and if any farmer had purchased the book he would not have found the title a misleading one and that he had been defrauded of his money but with his singular fawn-like face and clear eyes on his listener it was impossible to fall asleep or even to let the attention wander and incidentally even in his direct discourse there were little bright touches which one would not willingly have missed about hurdles he explained that it was common for the downland shepherds to repair the broken and worn-out ones with the long woody stems of the bithywind from the hedges and when i asked what the plant was he described the wild clematis or traveller's joy but those names he did not know to him the plant had always been known as bithywind or else devil's guts 
it struck me that Bithywind might have come by the transposition of two letters from Withybend, as if one would say Flutterby for Butterfly, or Flagondry for Dragonfly. Withybend is one of the numerous vernacular names of the common convolvulus. Lilybend is another, but what would old Gerard, who invented the pretty name of Traveller's Joy for that ornament of the wayside hedges, have said to such a name as Devil's Guts? There was, said Caleb, an old farmer in the parish of Bishop, who had a peculiar fondness for this plant, and if a shepherd pulled any of it out of one of his hedges, after leafing time, he would be very much put out. He would shout at him, "'Just you leave my devil's guts alone, or I'll not keep you on the farm.' And the shepherds, in revenge, gave him the unpleasant nickname of Old Devil's Guts, by which he was known in that part of the country." As a rule, talk about sheep, or any subject connected with sheep, would suggest something about sheep-dogs, individual dogs he had known or possessed, and who always had their own character and peculiarities, like human beings. They were good and bad and indifferent. A really bad dog was a rarity, but a fairly good dog might have some trick or vice or weakness. There was Sally, for example, a stump-tailed bitch, as good a dog with sheep as he ever possessed, but you had to consider her feelings. She would keenly resent any injustice from her master. If he spoke too sharply to her, or rebuked her unnecessarily for going a little out of her way just to smell at a rabbit burrow, she would nurse her anger until an opportunity came of inflicting a bite on some erring sheep. Punishing her would have made matters worse. The only way was to treat her as a reasonable being, and never to speak to her as a dog, a mere slave. Dyke was another dog he remembered well. He belonged to old shepherd Matthew Titt, who was head shepherd at a farm near Warminster, adjacent to the one where Caleb worked. Old Matt and his wife lived alone in their cottage out of the village, all their children having long grown up and gone away to a distance from home, and being so lonely by their two selves, they loved their dog just as others loved their relations. But Dyke deserved it, for he was a very good dog. One year Matt was sent by his master with lambs to Wayhill, the little village near Andover, where a great sheep fair is held in October every year. It was distant over thirty miles, but Matt, though old, was a strong man still, and greatly trusted by his master. From this journey he returned with a sad heart, for he had lost Dyke. He had disappeared one night while they were at Whale. Old Mrs. Titt cried for him as she would have cried for a lost son, and for many a long day they went about with heavy hearts. Just a year had gone by when one night the old woman was roused from sleep by loud knocks on the window-pane of the living-room below. "'Matt! Matt!' she cried, shaking him vigorously. "'Wake up! Old Dyke has come back to us!' "'What be you talking about?' growled the old shepherd. "'Lie down and go to sleep. You've been dreaming.' "'Tain't no dream. Tis Dyke. I know tis knock!' she cried, and getting up she opened the window and put her head well out. And there, sure enough, was Dyke, standing up against the wall, and gazing up at her, and knocking with his paw against the window below. Then Matt jumped up, and going together downstairs, they unbarred the door, and embraced the dog with joy, and the rest of the night was spent in feeding and caressing him, and asking him a hundred questions, which he could only answer by licking their hands and wagging his tail. It was supposed that he had been stolen at the fair, probably by one of the wild little lawless men called General Dealers, who go flying about the country in a trap drawn by a fast-trotting pony, that he had been thrown, muffled up, into the cart, and carried many a mile away, and sold to some shepherd, and that he had lost his sense of direction. But after serving a stranger a full year, he had been taken with sheep to Whale Fair, once more, and once there he knew where he was, and had remembered the road leading to his old home and master, and, making his escape, had travelled the thirty miles back to Warminster. The account of Dyke's return reminded me of an equally good story of the recovery of a lost dog, which I heard from a shepherd on the Avon. 
he had been lost over a year when one day the shepherd being out on the down with his flock stood watching two drovers travelling with a flock on the turnpike road below nearly a mile away and by and by hearing one of their dogs bark he knew at that distance that it was his dog i haven't a doubt he said to himself that if i know his bark he'll know my whistle with that he thrust two fingers in his mouth and blew his shrillest and longest whistle then waited the result presently he spied a dog still at a great distance coming swiftly towards him it was his own dog mad with joy at finding his old master did ever two friends long sundered by unhappy chance recognize each other's voices at such a distance and so come together once more whether the drovers had seen him desert them or not they did not follow to recover him nor did the shepherd go with them to find out how they had got possession of him it was enough that he had got his dog back no doubt in this case the dog had recognized his old home when taken by it but he was in another man's hands now and the habits and discipline of a life made it impossible for him to desert until that old familiar and imperative call reached his ears and he could not disobey then to go on with caleb's reminiscences there was badger owned by a farmer and worked for some years by caleb the very best stump tail he ever had to help him this dog differed from others in his vivacious temper and ceaseless activity when the sheep were feeding quietly and there was little or nothing to do for hours at a time he would not lie down and go to sleep like any other sheep dog but would spend his vacant time amusing of his self on some smooth slope where he could roll over and over then run back and roll over and over again playing by himself just like a child or he would chase a butterfly or scamper about over the down hunting for large white flints which he would bring one by one and deposit them at his master's feet pretending they were something of value and greatly enjoying the game this dog caleb said would make him laugh every day with his games and capers when badger got old his sight and hearing failed yet when he was very nearly blind and so deaf he could not hear a word of command even when it was shouted out quite close to him he was still kept with the flock because he was so intelligent and willing but he was too old at last it was time for him to be put out of the way the farmer however who owned him could not consent to have him shot and so the wistful old dog was ordered to keep at home at the farmhouse still he refused to be superannuated and not allowed to go to the flock he took to shepherding the fowls in the morning he would drive them out to their run and keep them there in a flock going round and round them by the hour and furiously hunting back the poor hens that tried to steal off to lay their eggs in some secret place this would not be allowed and so poor old badger who would have been too miserable if tied up had to be shot after all these were always his best stories his recollections of sheep-dogs for of all creatures sheep alone excepted he knew and loved them best yet for one whose life had been spent in that small isolated village and on the bare down about it his range was pretty wide and it even included one memory of a visitor from the other world let him tell it in his own words many say they don't believe there be such things as ghosties they never seed un and i don't say i believe or disbelieve what i hear tell i warn't there to see i only know what i seed myself but i don't say that it were a ghostie or that it wasn't one i was coming home late one night from the sheep twere close on eleven o'clock and a very quiet night with moonsheen that made it almost like day near the end of the village i come to the stepping-stones as we call em where there be a gate in the road and just by the road the four big white stones for people goin down from the village to the copse and the down on t'other side to step over the water in winter twas a stream there but the water it dried in summer and now twere summer time and there war no water when i get there i seed two women both on em tall with black gowns on and big bonnets they used to wear and they were standin face to face so close that the tops of their bonnets were almost touchin together 
who be these women out so late says i to myself why says i they be mrs dirk from up on the village and mrs gerge dirk the keeper's wife down by the copse then i thought i knowed how twas mrs garge she'd been to see mrs dirk in the village and mrs dirk she were coming out a leetle way with her so far as the stepping stones and they were just having a last leetle talk before saying good night but mine i heerd no talkin when i passed un and i'd hardly got past un before i says why what a fool be i mrs dirk she be dead a twelve month and i were in the churchyard and seed her buried myself whatever i be thinkin of that made me stop and turn round to look at it again and there they was just as i seed em at first mrs dirk who was dead a twelvemonth and mrs garge dirk from the copse standing there with her bonnets almost touching together and i couldn't hear nothin no talking they were so still as two posties and then something came over me like a tarrible coldness in the blood and down my back and i were afraid and turning i runned faster than i ever runned in my life and never stopped not till i got to the cottage it was not a bad ghost story but then such stories seldom are when coming from those who have actually seen or believe they have seen an immaterial being their principal charm is in their infinite variety you never find two real or true ghost stories quite alike and in this they differ from the weary inventions of the fictionist but invariably the principal subject was sheep i did always like sheep said caleb some did say to me that they couldn't abide shepherding because of the sunday work but i always said some one must do it they must have food in winter and water in summer and must be looked after and it can't be worse for me to do it it was on a sunday afternoon and the distant sound of the church bells had set him talking on this subject he told me how once after a long interval he went to the sunday morning service in his native village and the victor preached a sermon about true religion just going to church he said did not make men religious out there on the downs there were shepherds who seldom saw the inside of a church who were sober righteous men and walked with god every day of their lives caleb said that this seemed to touch his heart because he knowed it was true when i asked him if he would not change the church for the chapel now he was ill and his vicar paid him no attention while the minister came often to see and talk to him as i had witnessed he shook his head and said that he would never change he then added we always say that the chapel ministers are good men some say they be better than the parsons but all i've knowed all them that have talked to me have said bad things of the church and that's not true religion i say that the bible teaches different caleb could not have had a very wide experience and most of us know dissenting ministers who are wholly free from the fault he pointed out but in the purely rural districts in the small villages where the small men are found it is certainly common to hear unpleasant things said of the parish priest by his nonconformist rival and should the parson have some well-known fault or make a slip the other is apt to chuckle over it with a very manifest and most unchristian delight the atmosphere on that sunday afternoon was very still and by and by through the open window floated a strain of music it was from the brass band of the salvationists who were marching through the next village about two miles away we listened then caleb remarked somehow i never cared to go with them army people many say they've done a great good and i don't disbelieve it but there was too much what i call noise if sir you can understand what i mean i once heard the great dr parker speak the word imagination or as he pronounced it imagination with a volume of sound which filled a large building and made the quality he named seem the biggest thing in the universe that in my experience was his loftiest oratorical feat but i think the old shepherd rose to a greater height when after a long pause during which he filled his lungs with air he brought forth the tremendous word dragging it out gratingly so as to illustrate the sense in the prolonged harsh sound to show him that i understood what he meant very well i explained the philosophy of the matter as follows 
He was a shepherd of the downs who had lived always in a quiet atmosphere, a noiseless world, and from lifelong custom had become a lover of quiet. The Salvation Army was born in a very different world, in East London, the dusty, busy, crowded world of streets, where men wake at dawn to sounds that are like the opening of hell's gates, and spend their long strenuous days and their lives in that atmosphere, peopled with innumerable harsh noises, until they too acquire the noisy habit, and come at last to think that if they have anything to say to their fellows, anything to sell or advise or recommend from the smallest thing, from a mackerel or a cabbage or a pennyworth of milk, to a newspaper or a book or a picture or a religion, they must howl and yell it out at every passer-by. And the human voice not being sufficiently powerful, they provide themselves with bells and gongs and cymbals and trumpets and drums to help them in attracting the attention of the public. He listened gravely to this outburst, and said he didn't know exactly about that, but agreed that it was very quiet on the downs, and that he loved their quiet. Fifty years, he said, I've been on the downs and fields, day and night, seven days a week, and I've been told that it's a poor way to spend a life, working seven days for ten or twelve, or at most thirteen shillings. But I never seen it like that. I liked it, and I always did my best. You see, sir, I took a pride in it. I never left a place but I was asked to stay. When I left, it was because of something I didn't like. I couldn't never abide cruelty to a dog or any beast, and I couldn't abide bad language. If my master swore at the sheep or the dog, I wouldn't bide with he. No, not for a pound a week. I liked my work, and I liked knowing things about sheep. Not things in books, for I never had no books but what I found out with my own sense, if you can understand me. I remember when I were young, a very old shepherd on the farm. He had been more'n forty years there, and he was called Mark Dick. He told me that when he were a young man he was once putting the sheep in the fold, and there was one that was giddy, a young ewe. She was always a-turnin' round and round and round, and when she got to the gate she wouldn't go in, but kept on a-turning and a-turning, until at last he got angry, and lifting his crook, gave her a crack on the head, and down she went, and he thought he'd killed her. But in a little while up she jumps and trotted straight into the fold, and from that time she were well. Next day he told his master, and his master said with a laugh, well now you know what to do when you gets a giddy sheep some time after that mark dick he had another giddy one and remembering what his master had said he swung his stick and gave her a big crack on the skull and down went the sheep dead he'd killed it this time sure enough when he tells of this one his master said you've cured one and you've killed one now don't you try to cure no more he says well, some time after that I had a giddy one on my flock. I'd been thinking of what Mark Dick had told me, so I caught the ewe to see if I could find out anything. I were always a tarrible one for examining sheep when they were ill. I found this one had a swelling at the back of her head. It were like a soft ball, bigger than a walnut. So I took my knife and opened it, and out ran a lot of water, quite clear. And when I let her go she ran quite straight and got well. After that I did cure other giddy sheep with my life, but I found out there was some I couldn't cure. They had no swelling, and was giddy because they'd got a maggot in the brain or some other trouble I couldn't find out. Caleb could not have finished even this quiet Sunday afternoon conversation, in the course of which we had risen to lofty matters, without a return to his old favorite subject of sheep and his shepherding life on the downs. He was long miles away from his beloved home now, lying on his back, a disabled man who would never again follow a flock on the hills, nor listen to the sounds he loved best to hear, the multitudinous, tremulous bleatings of the sheep, the tinkling of numerous bells, and crisp ringing bark of his dog. But his heart was still there, and the images of past scenes were more vivid in him than they can ever be in the minds of those who live in towns and read books. "'I can see it now,' was a favorite expression of his when relating some incident in his past life. 
whenever a sudden light a kind of smile came into his eyes i knew that it was at some ancient memory a touch of quaintness or humour in some farmer or shepherd he had known in the vanished time his father perhaps or old john or mark dick or liddy or daniel burden the solemn seeker after buried treasure after our long sunday talk we were silent for a time and then he uttered those impressive words i don't say that i want to have my life again because twould be sinful we must take what is sent but if twas offered to me and i was told to choose my work i'd say give me my wiltshire downs again and let me be a shepherd there all my life long end of chapter twenty four end of a shepherd's life impressions of the south wiltshire downs by william henry hudson